So, uh, thank you so much for uh, all joining us here today for our first Eclipse Day in Florence. Um, I travel all the time, a lot. Uh, actually, uh, on Air Canada alone, I now have 1.5 million miles. Um, and I've been doing over 100,000 miles for 13 years, but this is the first trip I've ever made to Italy. Um, it's really nice. <laughs> I very much uh, enjoy it. It's, uh, and Florence in particular is just staggeringly beautiful. Um, I hope you appreciate what you, where you live. It's beautiful. Very, very, very nice. Whoops. Did I just do that? Um, okay, so I'm going to do a rather quick talk to try to explain how Eclipse works. And, but this is not really a technology talk. This is sort of a mix of a little bit of process, a little bit of business, a little bit of an explanation of what keeps Eclipse driving forward. And the first thing to understand is Eclipse is really big. Um, we now, on a fairly average month, have over two million downloads um, from the Eclipse download page. So we're, all we're, what we're measuring here is just the downloads from our software release page. It's not the nightlies, it's not the incremental builds, it's not the everyday work a day, people going to the project pages. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of developers, or an, it means that there are a lot of developers that are using Eclipse. Uh, we figure somewhere, by the, when you add in Java and C and C++, PHP and so on, when you add them all together, somewhere around 8 million developers use Eclipse on a pretty regular basis. Which means that Eclipse, in terms of the size of the ecosystem, um, competes head to head with Visual Studio. So Microsoft, when it comes to tools, Microsoft and Eclipse are basically the two major platforms for, for developer tools on the planet today. We have 185 members. Actually, this is a little bit out of date. I think I'm missing some, some logos. Um, and this, this is a big part of what makes all of this possible. So the members are what uh, amongst other things, pay my salary, pay for my travel, allow me to come to beautiful places like Florence. Um, but the, these companies are supporting uh, the Eclipse Foundation uh, through, their, through, through their annual dues. And one of the things that we've been seeing in the last couple of years as a major trend and one that the, the Eclipse Foundation, the, t the people who work there um, and the community as a whole are really embracing is a lot of the original companies that were involved in Eclipse were software companies. Now what we're seeing is a trend more and more towards enterprises becoming members and in particular industrials becoming members of the Eclipse Foundation and starting to participate in both use of Eclipse in their products uh, but also participating in the projects at Eclipse and contributing back to Eclipse. And I think this is a major new trend. Uh, open source first started out as being driven by the community, then it was driven uh, by a, to a large degree by, the, by software companies um, that were investing in shared platforms, and now what we're starting to see is what we would think of as consumers of technology or users of software becoming inv actively involved in open source. So just a quick rundown, 185 members, 11 of them are strategic members, so those are the ones that are on the board um, and, and are contributing developers, uh, promising, committing to develop, uh, to, uh, put developers into our projects. Um, we now have over a thousand committers uh, working on Eclipse projects, um, and those are being supported by over a hundred different companies. Uh, so it's a very large and diverse community uh, supporting Eclipse. One of the things that we are very, very proud of, and I think really helps define and differentiate Eclipse from the other organizations that are out there, is our focus on being a platform, and our focus on being predictable. Eclipse as a platform has shipped on time 
to the day every year for eight years in a row. It's actually a little bit longer than that, but we started, decided we would start counting with 3.0. All right, put your hand up if your organization has shipped on time to the day for eight years in a row. All right, so one of the things to keep in mind, the next time you're talking to your boss, your manager, or somebody about open source, and they say, oh, those open source guys, it's just a bunch of long hair people working in their mother's basement, and they're not serious, right? This is an example of what you can do in open source. And this is not trivial amounts of software, right? We're talking 46 million lines of code with over more than 400 developers working on it. Um, across, the, across the world in many locations from many different companies. And coordinating all of those activities so that you can ship on time to the day every year, year in, year out, is very, it, it, it is actually really cool how that works. That's a different talk. That's not the one we're gonna do today. <clears throat> so Eclipse has millions of users, there are literally thousands of products that are built on Eclipse. IBM alone has over 500 products that embed at least a part of Eclipse in, the, in their product. <clears throat> it has a little bit over 1,000 developers working on it. There's hundreds of companies, hundreds of projects, predictable schedules. Um, we're not going to talk about this, but we have world-class intellectual property management, so that's another thing you can tell your um, your boss sometime and we do all of this with 15 employees at the Eclipse Foundation right so this is there's somewhere there's a there's a business study in here about how you can do so much with so little um, it really is quite different from the standard ways of organizing businesses um, and yet it works um, we do have a we do actually have a well-defined process you can find uh, this talk on the, uh, on, the, on the web, I highly recommend it if you've, if you've never had a chance to, to go through it. But we do have a, um, a, we'd call it an agile process, but we do have a pretty well-defined way that we go about building our software. But I think from a technology point of view, um, a big part of how Eclipse works is its reliance on modularity. Not only technology, but organizationally, we could not do what we do if it wasn't for how modular everything was at Eclipse. So when you put together 62 projects for our release train last year, and actually this year it's going to be 71 projects, when you put together that many projects and get them to ship on one day, you need a well-defined uh, modularity story or it's not going to work. The plugins. Um, really allow everybody to extend Eclipse on exactly the same rules of engagement. So the plugin model is the same all the way up. So the folks that are working on the Eclipse platform are using the same, ver the same plugin architecture as you could be using to extend the Eclipse platform, which means it's a level playing field from a technology perspective. And by the way, this is not entirely unique to Eclipse. Virtually every major and successful open source community has some version of this modularity story, this extensibility story. Uh, T Tim O'Reilly called it the architecture of participation. If you don't have some way to extend your platform, then you cannot excite a community um, on, uh, around what you're building. But turning to the business side of this, you know, why do we have 100 companies investing in the Eclipse platform? Uh, you know, why does IBM have 140 developers and you know, I think Oracle has something like 30, SAP somewhere around 30 as well. You know, these are large companies making very large investments. Why are they doing this? And the answer is, is because open source solves a lot of business problems, right? Whether it's cost, time to market, agility, innovation, open source helps all of these. And the other thing to keep in mind, and this is what I think what is driving enterprises into becoming more involved in open source, is that software is eating the world. 
There are so many systems and things which used to be hardware or mechanical or electromechanical which are now largely being driven by software. And that means that there are many companies around the world that are struggling with how do we go from being a mechanical company or an electrical company, how do we deal with the fact that now what we need to do is become a software company? What are the best practices? And what they're learning is that today, the best practices for software development are things that you learn from the open source community, not from proprietary software companies. And just a couple of examples of how software has impacted business today. Um, so the Boeing 787 uh, is a, uh, um, something that Boeing has been working on for many years. They're finally just launching it, but it was something on the order of two and a half or three years late um, based on their original schedule. The last major problem that they had that delayed the program by almost an entire year was the, the software that runs the brakes. And the interesting thing is it wasn't that the software didn't work. The plane could land, the brakes worked, everything was just fine. But the company that Boeing outsourced the software development to didn't follow the right process. So they couldn't certify the software to the government authorities. So they had to go back and rewrite the whole thing using the right process and that delayed the program for a year. Right, this is just one example of how software is just dramatically affecting so much. If you look at, uh, this is compliments of Airbus, if you look at what they're doing now and see the growth of the amount of software that they're putting in aircraft over the years, you can certainly see the trend line, right? Way back when they first started, they had something like you know, 37K lines of code, 37,000 lines of code going into an aircraft. Now they're up to 108 million, right? So this, so this again, software is eating the world. Software is controlling so much. 90% of the uh, innovations that are happening in the automotive industry are actually being driven by software, whether it is the consumer electronics that are going into the dashboard or whether it's the real-time controllers for the engine or the brakes software is driving innovation in the, in, the, in the automotive world today. 20 million lines of code in an S-Class Mercedes. But why, now what does this mean for open source? Well, what, what more and more companies are finding is that it is mu very much to their business advantage to embrace open source. The process by which we innovate in open source and the use of openness and transparency and meritocracy helps them get things done better and faster. And if you want to grow a software platform, if you want people to use your software, free is a really good price. Um, it, it means that your software can become ubiquitous. If there's no, no barriers to distribution of the software, it means you can send it around the world with no transaction cost and no friction. It means that the adoption rates can go like this very, very quickly. And the traditional software model is broken. Because if you look how proprietary companies build software, every time you are, every time you are spending or uh, building infrastructure, you're not building something that your customers actually care about. Right? If you think of the amount of software that we write, and then think about the 5, 10, 20 features that your customers actually care about, and then try to map the features to the amount of code that is in the entire system, it's pretty clear that a lot of software gets written that your customers don't actually care about. So what open source allows you to do is very precisely define what your differentiators are and then focus your energies on those and pull together all of the other stuff from open source. You can innovate through integration with open source. You can assemble components through open source that greatly accelerates your ability to ship products that your customers actually want. So at Eclipse, the, really the mantra that, that's forcing, that, that is getting companies to participate in Eclipse is this one. 
right? Compete on the products, compete on the systems that you're building, but collaborate on the platform. And we have lots of examples at Eclipse of projects where we have, you know, fierce competitors in the marketplace like IBM and SAP and Oracle working on the same project, working on the same platform. And they're doing that because it's saving them money and allows them to put their resources elsewhere. So what we're seeing is more and more enterprises now starting to go up the maturity, this maturity curve. It used to be that software companies were the ones that were going through this. You know, even Microsoft has gone from deny to use. Right? There are now pieces of open source in Microsoft products. Microsoft actually sells, uh, actually do they sell, no, they, well there's, Microsoft ships for free Eclipse plugins, right? So you can get an Eclipse plugin to, for, to, so that Eclipse will work with the Microsoft Team Foundation server, right? So even Microsoft recognizes the importance of the Eclipse ecosystem. But now what we're starting to see is enterprises and industrials move through this same maturity model where they go from their lawyers say they're not allowed to use open source into, well, we have to use open source. And if we're using open source, then it makes business sense to contribute back. And then it makes sense to actually lead or champion projects. But then what's really interesting is then now we're starting to see some, some enterprises get to this stage where instead of thinking about open source just as a way for them to save costs inside their engineering organization, what can they do to use open source to drive industry platforms um, for shared infrastructure? What it, what can, how can they use open source to redefine their relationships with their supply chain? So if you look at, for example, um, a large automotive company, it's not unusual for them to have 100 suppliers using a lot of different software tools with very little interoperability between those software tools what we're seeing them do is drive into their supply chain the notion that they should all be using a common Eclipse-based platform for their tool development and getting a lot of efficiencies out of their supply chain by doing so. So one example that, of a company that we've been working with and another example of, of, why, uh, of the kinds of problems that open source can help solve is if you look at what Airbus has to do with the Airbus 300, so the program started in 1972, um, and they built the last one in 2007, right? So that's 35 years of development and then production. Support is gonna last until 2050, which means they have to support not only the software running in that aircraft, but the tool chain that built the software for 78 years. Airbus has done a very long study on how they could possibly do this. And they have come to the conclusion that open source, an open source platform and an open source ecosystem is the only possible solution to this. They've looked at every possible example of using, working with small companies, working with large companies, working with academia, and in every single case, it fails if you go out far enough in time. Of course, we don't know whether open source is really going to solve this problem. What we do know is it's the most likely scenario to solve this problem because of the longevity of open source and the, and the ability to share code over the long term, the ability to build a community around that code, and the ability to create an ecosystem around that code. So these are the models. This is the, their, their points. Um, Continuity, uh, avoiding single source dependency, making, uh, taking advantage of more innovation and risk taking, helping to standardize by using open source. And this led them to start um, with us at the Eclipse Foundation, the PolarSys um, initiative uh, for doing onboard software development for very, very long term life cycles. And this is again an example of Airbus using open source, working with the Eclipse Foundation to help drive the notion of a common tooling platform into their supply chain and into their organization with a goal to maintaining this for the very, very long term. So this is the kind of trend that we're starting to see at the Eclipse Foundation.
and the kind of participation that we're getting from industrials. There's other examples. We're doing very similar things in automotive. We're doing very similar things with um, the people that are uh, doing uh, train signaling systems for high-speed uh, high train systems in Europe. Uh, we're doing very similar things with folks that are working on smart grids. But the trend is clear. Uh, this is sort of the next wave of open source as these kinds of companies start to learn how to build software in the open source way. Uh, and the Eclipse Foundation is actually getting a lot of practice helping companies like this get engaged with the open source community, learn how to do open source, learn how to behave in a, in a community oriented way with transparency and openness, meritocracy. These are things, they're all things that you have to learn. Um, and particularly from very conservative organizations, it can be a big culture change. Um, and so that's something that we've been doing a lot, spending a lot of time uh, at with the Eclipse Foundation um, for the last couple of years. So thank you, and uh, hopefully I have time for a few questions. Thank you.